Well, good evening, and a very warm welcome to, uh, to, to, to you all. Welcome to those in the room. Welcome to those who are watching on the, on the live stream. I hope you're sitting comfortably where, wherever you are. And for those watching on YouTube uh, in the future sometime, uh, I hope you enjoy this little piece of history. It's, uh, uh, these are really important events for, for UEA, to be able to showcase some of the research that is done at UEA uh, and the achievements of some of our professorial staff. And uh, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be able to, uh, to do the introduction today. I'm uh, Professor Philip Gilmartin. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for Science. It's a great pleasure today to be able to introduce Professor Jenny Barclay. Jenny began her career with a first degree in geology from the University of Edinburgh, followed by a PhD from the University of Bristol. Jenny's real passion within geology is volcanology. Her first, first postdoctoral research project involved an experimental investigation of the magma storage conditions of the newly erupting Sufria Hills volcano. This was followed by two further postdoctoral positions at the University of California and the University of Geneva. Around this time, Jenny undertook several periods as a duty scientist at the Montserrat Volcano Observatory. Experiences such as these convinced her for the need for a truly interdisciplinary approach in order to properly understand the volcanic eruptions and mitigate their impact. Since joining UEA in 1999, Jenny has taken the opportunity to collaborate with a diverse array of researchers here at UEA, from sed sedimentologists, atmospheric scientists, and geophysicists through to social scientists on a variety of problems relating to volcanic phenomena. Jenny lit up the UEA's 50th anniversary celebrations with Norfolk's firework volcano in 2013, a scaled down but still most impressive model of Mount Merapi. Jenny has since brought that volcano to the Natural History Museum and I was fortunate to be there to see it in its full glory. It's also been to the grounds of the Norwich Cathedral. Jenny is currently Professor of Volcanology in the School of Environmental Sciences here at UEA. Volcanoes have inspired wonder and fear in equal measure for centuries, yet we still do not understand them well enough to be able to forecast when they will erupt and how they will affect the populations who live nearby. In her lecture this evening, Jenny will explore how volcanologists piece together the information that they have. This helps them understand volcanic eruptions and, how, and gives insights into volcanic behaviour. And, and uh, these can come from a surprising range of people, from meteorologists to historians and writers. Please join me now in welcoming Professor Jenny Barclay to give her inaugural lecture. Jenny. Thank you. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here uh, this afternoon, or this evening really, to share a little bit of um, my volcano love with you all. Uh, and talk a little bit about some of the things that I've done since I've come to UEA uh, in the name of um, volcanology. What I start, thought I'd start out by doing is by trying to kind of explain to you a little bit why it is that volcanoes are such a fascinating natural phenomenon um, for us all to work on. Uh, as many of you will probably know, we've got volcanoes because the Earth has a thin crust which moves around the surface, creating plate tectonic motions. And most of the world's volcanoes, which are shown in this map of the world here as red dots, are associated with the edges of the world's tectonic plates. So they tend to be concentrated uh, where two plates meet and magma rises up towards the surface. But these plates aren't evenly distributed about the Earth, and that's something that I'll come back to a little bit later when I tell you about um, the relationship between um, volcanoes and rainfall. One thing the evil eagle-eyed among you might have already spotted is if you look at the equator here, there's a lot more small, uh, much more active plates, and so you can see some rings of quite intense concentration of volcanoes around the world. However, this is the amassed collection of um, volcanoes, top trumps volcanoes. Uh, myself uh, and some of my fellow researchers on the Striva project chose 30 volcanoes to turn into a playing pack. And these are the 
uh, crowdsourced photographs of different volcanoes around the world. And I thought this was one of the best ways to kind of illustrate to you that not all volcanoes are the same. Some volcanoes are very different to others. And each volcano has its own different personality and is capable of behaving in quite a wide range of behaviours. So that's one of the things that kind of presents us with one of the challenges. They're both beautiful and astonishing when they erupt, but they also have a capability to have a very wide variety of behaviours in a huge variety of locations around the world. One of the things that, um, if we want to play stone, paper, scissors with some other natural hazards that picks volcanoes out as well, is the duration over which they erupt. This is a compilation of the 3,000 plus known historical eruptions um, from around the world, and it's showing um, the average duration as a percentage. And you can see that the median amount of time that a volcano erupts for is not the kind of 24-hour phenomenon that we usually see in the media. It's actually six to seven weeks worth of chuntering on, doing things, changing its mind, maybe deciding not to erupt for a while. And in some cases, we actually have some volcanoes at the tail end round here who've been erupting for many decades. In fact, the Romans referred to Stromboli as the lighthouse of the Mediterranean, and that's because it's been reliably erupting every 10 or 15 minutes or so since the times of the Romans. So some volcanoes are really very long-lived indeed, and some of them can just start up, have an eruption, and then go back to sleep for a while. So they're quite a complex phenomenon to kind of work with. So one of the ways we deal with this is we've created uh, volcanologists something called the Volcanic Explosivity Index, an index much loved of many A-level geography classes. And I just thought, just to give you a sense of some of the variations in behaviour that volcanoes do, I'll give you a little visual guide to um, VEI. So you can see, uh, this is Yasser volcano here in uh, Vanuatu, <coughs> a photograph taken by um, Anna Hicks. You can see two people standing right in front of that explosion. VEI 1 or 2 are gentle, firework-type explosions where the column goes up just a few thousand metres. They last just a few thousands of seconds. And in the historical record, there's many thousands of these types of eruption. In fact, probably somewhere during the course of this lecture, this sort of phenomenon will happen a couple of times. It's kind of like uh, the volcanologist equivalent of the seismic Richter scale. It's an order of magnitude scale. So as we go up to VEI 3, you start to see much more um, intense, large eruptive columns here, where you have uh, explosions that last for a few minutes. But still, these are something that we see all around the world, and there's... Um, VEI-3 eruptions reliably pretty much every single year. As we start to go up in size, we start to see the kind of volcanoes that's going to erupt, and it's going to not just get into the troposphere, but it's going to move up into the stratosphere and start to cause uh, damage around the world, kind of ash that will be able to circulate all the way around the world, and eruptions that last for hours. And that picture there... <coughs> is a picture of the 1990 um, eruption of Mount Pinotivo, and there's a few hundreds of these in the geological record. The really astonishing eruptions are the ones once we get up to VEI 6 and 7, and there's only a few of those in our, um, uh, in our memory, and that's in our historical memory, and they tend to erupt so much material that what they leave behind is a hole, and a caldera. So I don't have a big picture to show you of this because there's not been an eruption of this size since uh, photographs began. And then this afternoon, of course, VEI-8 is the one that we hear about all the time. It's the supervolcanoes. And I googled supervolcano picture and I couldn't find a, <laughs> a single picture that I thought was scientifically acceptable. So I've just <laughs> left it there as a blank. Um, these are the eruptions that happen really only every tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years, but we hear all about those in the news because they happen over days and they would have a global impact. So when we think about volcanic eruptions, they can happen over all these sorts of scales. And indeed, some volcanoes are actually capable of having, during the course of an eruptive cycle, a VEI 1 or 2 gentle explosion and then a much bigger explosion as well. So it's a real challenge for us in terms of trying to understand um, what happens with eruptions. And this graph kind of 
illustrates that challenge. So this is just really thinking about the interval between the start of an eruption and a paroxysmal piece of activity. So a piece of activity that actually happens that is uh, much larger than, say, the VEI3. And you can see here, sometimes volcanoes start with a bang, about 40% of them. But there's a significant tail where the volcano can rumble on, looking uncertain, looking like it might be leading up to a larger eruption and then go. And this is a compilation that we've made as part of the Striever project here, these red lines, which actually point out when uh, we see fatalities. So when society and volcanoes are not mixing too well, if you like, during the course of volcanic eruptions, you can see that one of the big challenges that we have here is actually not that these volcanoes will start and then many people will die because we don't predict it in the beginning. It's actually just starting to think about how volcanoes change their behavior during the course of an eruption too. So all of this means that being a volcanologist is a pretty challenging business and you've pretty much got to get every piece of tool out of your armory to try and understand how these erupt and how we can actually do better at kind of dealing with this uncertainty. They're kind of an example of a scientific hazardous phenomena that is uncertainty extreme. Given unrest, we can't reliably predict that the volcano will definitely erupt. Given that the volcano started to have a smaller eruption, we only have some inkling of whether that's going to accelerate and change. So we have to try to use other means to forecast what we think is going on. Um, but all's not lost. There's two things that we can do. And the first of these is much more within the domain of uh, the physical scientists. What we can do is we can think about improving the prediction and forecasting. Can we do better? Can we start to think about how to forecast the size of an eruption or given unrest? Can we actually say it will definitely erupt? But the other thing that we can do is actually work with societies to understand better and, and reduce risk. And that's one of the things that being here in the School of Environmental Sciences has been a fantastic opportunity for me to engage not only with the scientific aspect of uh, understanding volcanic eruptions, but also to think much more carefully about uh, the physical processes as well. <coughs> so as Phil said, uh, I started out in life very much as a rock-bothering volcanologist, someone who uses rocks to understand something about what happens prior to an eruption. And that's not quite as mad as you think it might be, because you think, well, so if the rocks have come out of the volcano, who cares? It's happened. Where's the actual help in that? But the secret with these rocks actually lies within... Uh, this grey image here, which is a backscattered electron image, it's just a couple of millimetres across, which shows you some of the crystals that are locked up within the rocks. And what those crystals do is they record the changing conditions as that magma makes its way to the surface. And we're kind of like the volcanological, the petrologists I think of as the volcanological equivalent of the team from Waking the Dead. Because basically, obviously, a murder has happened, there's been an eruption, but what we can do is we can use the way in which those crystals are in the rock to try and reconstruct <coughs> what happened prior to that eruption and what it was about the changing conditions that happened. The eagle-eyed uh, trained spotters amongst you will have noticed that this rock's a rock in two halves, there's this uh, liquid here with some bigger crystals and then this one here that looks much, much crunchier with sort of smaller crystals and much smaller holes within it. So these are actually two different types of magma that have mixed together um, in the run-up to the eruption. And one of the things uh, with my PhD supervisors when I was doing my PhD that I learned from both of them was the incredible importance of not just picking up a rock and then looking at it out of context, it was actually about understanding the volcanic system, understanding really carefully how those rocks were erupted and using that to then try and reconstruct the sequence of what it was that you'd seen. But I think it's um, fair to say that uh, immediately following my PhD, the thing that really changed my life in terms of thinking through about volcanic processes was the opportunity to work at Sufriar Hills Volcano. 
Soufriere Hills is a tiny little volcano, stratovolcano, in, on the Caribbean island of um, Montserrat, uh, which at the time of the start of the eruption had a population of about 11,000 people. But those 11,000 people, you can probably just see at the base of this picture of the volcano here, were absolutely living in close proximity uh, to this erupting volcano, and most of them didn't actually want to move. And you're probably wondering why I've got a picture of the Wizard of Oz uh, standing up here uh, to represent the Soufriere Hills eruption. I guess, for me, the experience of actually working in the Volcano Observatory alongside doing the kind of slightly drier scientific expertise of, of uh, de detangling um, the rocks was a little bit like that moment, and this is what I tried to find a picture of, in the Wizard of Oz when you kind of pass out from dull old Kansas into the wonderful... Uh, multicolored world of Oz. It was an opportunity, really, to understand how you take those, um, uh, take that understanding of the rock and how it's actually applied by people trying to make sense of what to do next uh, in, uh, in the teeth of a volcanic crisis. And it kind of really changed um, my way of thinking. And I'm extremely grateful to a lot of the scientists who were geophysicists. Uh, and geologists of different uh, descriptions who I worked with um, at the time. And there you go, there's uh, me uh, hanging out in a helicopter with the doors off, because that's the kind of thing you get to do when you work on an erupting volcano, um, uh, with the Soufriere Hills volcano uh, smoking away in the background. But really, those kind of insights in terms of that exposure to thinking about what the implications were of the uncertainty uh, were really important. This is an example uh, of the type of reconstructive work that you can do if you really carefully think about the eruptive activity. This is a very beautiful volcano, which we did reproduce on the mound here um, at UEA, Merapi, which is in Indonesia. And this is a picture from 2010, and it looks quite benign in this long exposure photograph here. There's little poles of material coming down, red hot material but sometimes it can have much more violent upkicks in activity, uh, generate impulsive behavior, and then generate one of these things here, which is the pyroclastic flow. And this is actually the very first pyroclastic flow that went down uh, the sides of the Soufriere Hills volcano, and you can just see uh, the lap of destruction going on there. They sit at about two or 300 degrees centigrade, uh, people who are in the pathway of those have got no chance of actually surviving. So they're extremely dangerous, but many people live around the slopes of the volcano. So this is a really nice piece of um, field mapping that Katie did to very, very carefully constrain where you pick up the rocks from to understand which part of the eruption uh, it is that you're interested in. And then the idea is that you look at the different types of rocks. And hopefully I can convince you here, these pictures here, these photomicrographs of backscattered electron image are very, very different in character and what we can do there is use that to understand and reconstruct the driving forces behind these different changes in, in behavior. The eruptive activity of Merapi in 2010 was actually what's called a 100-year eruption. It was an eruption that was much bigger than anything that they'd had for 100 years. They had six hours warning in which they had to move 300,000 people out and into football stadiums to get them out ahead of this sort of um, eruptive process. So trying to use this sort of reconstruction will enable us to look at what the monitored data said and tell us about a gas-rich pulse of magma that came up very rapidly through the system and caused the volcano to change its behavior. So uh, the petrological material has got a lot to offer in terms of understanding volcanic activity. And this is me uh, <coughs> more recently um, on Montserrat. And again, it's just to say one of the things we often forget about is the incredible value of looking at rocks in the field and um, the huge value that we saw. Uh, I went with Ricky and we noticed that there were a lot more of these um, uh, lenses of material that had pulsed into the volcano and we've been mapping those out. We published a paper just a couple of weeks ago uh, from another PhD student's thesis that demonstrates how that supply has been changing and has been one of the driving forces behind uh, the 18 year old eruption of Soufriere Hills. So rocks have got a lot to offer us in terms of kind of understanding um, eruptions. I read a very uh, slightly aggravating article in the Times Higher Ed just before Christmas about how 
being a successful academic was a solitary pursuit. It made me feel really cross as I was thinking about putting this lecture together. And academic being a good professor is anything but a solitary pursuit. And so I guess at the end of each of these bits, I've got these different little bits, pieces of a professorship that kind of come together. All these people who've contributed ideas and thinking uh, towards this. And I've marked out in yellow uh, the PhD students who've kind of helped along the way. So this is my rock bit of uh, the puzzle, uh, just before I move on uh, to talk about rain. <coughs> so, oops, the eagle-eyed amongst you will have noticed that we have this concentration of volcanoes that also concentrates in and around um, the equator. It just so happens, or, or maybe it doesn't just so happen, that there's a lot of smaller microplates. So the generation of more vigorous uh, magmatic systems tend to happen in and around the tropics. And so there's a very, very strong association between volcanic activity and um, weather. And it cuts um, a couple of different ways. And the stuff that we've done here at UEA to do with the interaction between uh, weather and volcanoes is a really nice example, actually, of the two different ways in which you can improve forecasting around volcanoes. So there's two ways you can do it. You can observe the phenomenon a lot, a lot, a lot, and then basically talk about a probabilistic forecast. So it's quite likely that 60% chance that this will happen. Or we can take a more deterministic approach, which is a bit closer to what I was talking about with the petrology, where basically you pull things apart, you understand the scientific physical relationships between them, and then use that to kind of try and explain um, cause and effect. And the rainfall stuff that we've done is a little bit of an example of how you can do um, both in volcanology. I would say this now, it's going to make my husband very happy, but we as volcanologists are much less sophisticated forecasting scientists than meteorologists as a whole. So it's quite helpful to us uh, to work with meteorologists. Now, you might not recognise Adrian in this photograph, uh, who's one of the uh, meteorologists here at um, UEA. This is us in um, Montserrat in 2001. And this is one of the... The reason I wanted to give this example is this is one of the really uh, splendid things about coming to UEA. Really, really, in the School of Environmental Sciences, we have a coffee room in the middle of the department, and people meet there, and they talk about their science together. And uh, when I first started at UEA, this was about a conversation between um, myself, uh, Adrian Matthews, who's in this photo here, and then kneeling down here is um, Jan Alexander. And I come back from Montserrat, and I was kind of frustrated by the fact that people largely seem to ignore a phenomenon where water mixes with loose volcanic debris and then generates something called lahars. I was like, nobody cares about lahars. They're really important. They cause a lot of problems for the people in Montserrat. We should study lahars. And it worked really well because Jan's a sedimentologist and Adrian's a meteorologist. And he said, what we need to do is we need to buy a lot of rain gauges and we need to install them all around the island, which is what this um, network is here. And then we're going to do some really awesome rain forecasting and we'll have a very good idea relative to the, when the rain falls, uh, whether the lahars are going to occur. And that was great. So we went out and we had a great time. We installed the uh, 10 tipping bucket rain gauges and then it didn't rain for seven months. <laughs> so our project wasn't going very well. But then when it did rain, the volcano also erupted. And that was incredible. It felt like there was a relationship uh, between uh, the rainfall and then this phenomenon where uh, in Montserrat, the volcano kind of piles up in a big pile of andesitic lava and then falls down the side of the volcano, generating pyroclastic flows and something called a dome collapse. It's pretty dangerous times. So this graph here is a couple of them because it did it again and again, which was uh, very handy for us. And these are from a couple of papers that we wrote after this. The blue lines are the rainfall with the rainfall rate, which we measured in our very splendid tipping bucket rain gauges, of which five were destroyed in that, in that first dome collapse. So it is a little bit of a tale of woe, uh, the start of this research project. And then you can see here 
this is the onset of um, seismic activity. So seismic activity around a volcano when it's erupting is a very good measure of the size of the, the eruption because generally what happens is it gets really ashy and dark and you can't actually see too much what's going on. So there's this really nice uh, phenomenon. So what we decided to do was actually try to see whether we could see if there was, and of course a lot of volcanologists were quite sceptical about this, they were like, uh, you can't use rain to forecast a volcano. So what we set out to do was find some data streams and use these, um, <coughs> um, use these to try and see if we could see some correlations between the two data streams. And there's good data that you can use. Seismic data, as I said, is a measure of energy release but it comes from all sorts of different sources. Uh, but we thought, well, let's try and look at this. It's a good continuous measure. That's something that we can correlate one with the other. And then the other one is uh, the rainfall data. This is actually overly honest uh, rainfall data that I've reproduced here in that line because we did have a lot of problem because actually rainfall around volcanoes is quite acid. Our tipping bucket rain gauges were metal. And so we had quite a lot of corrosive problems uh, with that data set. And then, and most important of all, is our observational data. And so we kind of set out and managed to establish the statistical um, relationship between the probability of large rainfall event and then seismic event. And we were able to test for the significance of that correlation. And it worked for the whole of that phase of activity on the volcano. It's actually not worked since, but for those three or four years which we were doing that correlation, uh, we, uh, it was clearly observed. And then uh, since then, it's also been observed quite on uh, many different uh, settings. So that's quite well and good. But then one of the next things that we set out to do is try to actually uh, move from just having a correlation of time series to trying to actually physically uh, understand the process. So we produced some models uh, for what we thought was going on and the time scale over which it was going, where the cooling water basically was going into, this, into the interior of the dome, reheating and then expanding and then causing a semi-explosive failure. And we were able to correlate that with the time scales over which we saw the different types of earthquakes. And uh, we felt very pleased with ourselves. So that was uh, quite nice. And then, in the end, we did actually do some work um, on lahars as well. And we took a very similar principle to that which you have <coughs> under the watchful eye of Jan, where what we want to do is take very, very careful and detailed uh, analyses of the deposits and also uh, the phenomena as they occur and use them to kind of interpret what's going on at the observed lahars and then use these to better forecast where they're coming next. And that's uh, some work that we still uh, are doing uh, at the moment uh, with Jerry Phillips at the University of Bristol. So we've had a great time. And I have to say, the media loves a correlation. And this is the one that pops up still the most randomly 10 years after we kind of did the first piece of work. Somebody will phone us up and go, oh, I hear you've done something about rainfall triggering volcanic activity. And yes, this is the one that everybody likes. But it's a really nice example of how when you have a lot of scientists in a different... Uh, from different disciplines coming together to kind of share problems, you can actually solve one uh, without realising it. So this is the uh, splendid people who've helped out with the uh, rain part. So then a lot of the uh, last few years, however, have been dedicated to moving on to thinking about risk. I think once you start dabbling and being interested in the societal implications of uh, what you're working on. It's kind of a, it's a road that you start walking down and then more and more do doors keep opening and um, it, it is something that has occupied me for quite a lot of the time in the last few years. And once uh, you start thinking more broadly, uh, it becomes clear that thinking about the interactions between human society and disasters, so when a hazardous event turns into something that is negative for the people around, you can see that this is something that we're having to start dealing with a lot more. And this is uh, one of the latest pieces of data from the UNISDR, the office here charged with disaster risk reduction. And then this is something uh, from one of the more recent uh, outputs that I wanted to share with you, just because I think this is what's really important about disasters and what's important about disasters uh, in the next few decades. So this is a measure of life years lost per 100,000 people. And this is split into four income groups. So we sit here 
Uh, however you think Brexit's going to pan out for us, we're still going to sit in the high income uh, bracket. And then most of the rest of the world's population sits in upper middle, lower middle, and low income. And you can see that uh, in terms of <coughs> the interactions of hazardous events with negative outcomes for people around the world, there's a disproportionate impact on the people who have the least. And there's again a correlation when you start to think uh, globally about where those incredibly active plate tectonic areas are, where the plates are subdivided, working very vigorously. There's lots of volcanoes, but there's also lots of earthquakes. Uh, there's a strong correlation there too. And um, this is a little analysis just to illustrate that from uh, something that we did during the course of Striva. I spent a lot of uh, my research career working on um, volcanic islands because they are incredible places to work. Uh, I put this one in because I thought you might like to look at an island that looked a bit like a James Bond layer for, for a while. Um, this is Aegoshima volcano in Japan. But this is an analysis of islands uh, around the world and it's just looking at where they are in the world uh, relative to the equator. So this is latitude both north and south of the equator. This line here shows you the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. So basically anything below that line is subjected not only if it's in a tectonically active area to earthquakes and volcanoes, but also to all kinds of uh, hydrometeorological related weather phenomena, intense rainfall, changing rainfall, all the things that can be thrown at it. And what the orange triangles demonstrate are those islands uh, which are um, volcanic, and which are uh, also classified as small island developing states. So basically, this simple analysis, there is nowhere that is a small island developing state. So somewhere that has a lower, relatively <coughs> lower income is on a less good development trajectory than our, um, our particular island. Um, they are all sitting uh, south of the Tropic of Cancer or the Tropic of Capricorn. And most of them, you can see there's a real concentration of uh, places that are having to deal with a real marasma of different types of hazards. So volcanoes, once you start thinking about disaster risk, you can't think about it in isolation. There is no such thing as a volcano erupting in a tectonically inactive area. You have to have both together. And almost all of the ones uh, in developing countries have got very strong association with hydrometeorological phenomena as well. So you have to start thinking in a much more uh, rounded way about risk uh, once you start doing that. And then on top of that, we have to contend with the fact that when volcanoes do erupt, they erupt over relatively long periods of time. So we have all sorts of different things that can come out of volcanoes. Lahars, pyroclastic flows, ash, ballistics. But then on top of that, we actually have to start thinking about um, <clears throat> social phenomena on top of those. And those are dynamic too. People don't just sit there statically in the piece of life or the stage of life that they're at because of volcanoes erupting. All of those processes are in motion as well. <clears throat> so one of the things that we wanted to think about as part of the Striva project, which has been a long-term project looking at um, resilience to volcanic risk, uh, in volcanic areas is really to start thinking quite differently about risk and thinking about it as dynamic and where both um, the uh, physical and the social processes are extremely interlinked. So we had a pilot phase which meant that we were all able to work together uh, with our observatory partners who are here who have been absolutely uh, fantastic as part of this program. The Instituto Geophysical in Ecuador, the Seismic Research Centre in Trinidad and Tobago who work in the English-speaking Caribbean, and then the Servicio Geologico in Colombia who've all been fantastic partners. And not only that, but what these books represent here is the immense amount of learning that they have from the lived experience that they've got of living through all of these different uh, volcanic eruptions that have occurred uh, within their uh, living memory. And so what we wanted to do is kind of open up those books and actually take advantage of them, but also work with the populations at risk to understand something about what was important to them. And uh, because I do seem to be obsessed by waking the dead, it is called, the we decided to call this analysis uh, forensic analysis of recent eruptions where no piece of evidence um, was unturned. 
And these photographs represent some of the things we did um, on Montserrat. And one of the things that amazed me the most about this is Montserrat's probably one of the most studied eruptions, certainly here in the UK, uh, of recent decades. Uh, but when we asked local people to come and tell us about how it had affected them, they were doing things that they had never shared before or were able to share before, and it was a pretty um, astonishing experience um, for everyone. That It seemed amazing to me that people hadn't thought to ask uh, the people about what their lived experience was. But here's all the different types of evidence, the scientific evidence, uh, some of the evaluations done by DFID, our own timelines, and then people basically just telling their own stories. Uh, about what happened during the course of eruption. And we've done that in Montserrat, in Ecuador, uh, in St. Vincent in the Caribbean as well, and in, in Colombia. And one of the features of this project that we have learned is you can't just go there once. We've been there again, and back again, and back again. But it's been an incredibly um, enriching experience for us because I think one of the things people <coughs> worry about when you start to work in interdisciplinary science is that there's a compromise to be had in terms of the quality of the research that you're doing. And actually, we're finding the opposite to be true now. That the things, the scientific gaps that are being suggested to us by working in this way with the populations as rates has actually given us some really powerful insights into where we're getting it wrong and things that we need to work a little bit harder on to do better. And I've got a couple of examples of those just to kind of uh, discuss. So the first of these is thinking about um, volcanic ash. Actually, Strever was not meant to be about volcanic ash because it's not very deadly. And uh, we were all about, you know, really improving resilience. But what people told us in the first few workshops we had was that volcanic ash was one of the strongest contributors to losing resilience in the context of a volcano erupting. So you imagine ash is, is dirty, it's messy, it's gritty, it's abrasive. So it's instead of it snowing beautiful white fluffy snow, it's like actually people snow the grit at you instead. Uh, it's very uh, unattractive. We obviously hear about it because of its disruption of air traffic, but it had a huge impact on individual livelihoods, crops and livestock, infrastructure, and even human health. So we've ended up doing a lot more work on ash um, as a result of this. Uh, this is the beautiful uh, Soufriere St. Vincent. You can see just the lava dome here uh, from 1979 here. And this is the remembered damage uh, from impacts. There were a series of eruptions in 1979 in St. Vincent, long time ago, but people still remembered the relative impacts that there had been um, from the volcanic ash. And actually, uh, what Roger and Teresa found uh, when they worked out there was that, in fact, the devastation or the issues around the ash were as strong, if not as stronger, than some of the issues around floods and hurricanes, which are what you hear a lot more about um, in the uh, Caribbean. And the same was true for uh, Tungarawa volcano, uh, where we also worked. So this is a uh, very wonderful uh, Tungarawa volcano, just having a tiny wee um, explosion. These are the Vahias, the network of volcano work watchers who work around here. Beautifully fertile flanks around the slopes of the volcano. Uh, but what <coughs> uh, Roger and Teresa found when they subdivided these different zones around, this is the town of Banos, uh, and then um, <coughs> two other zones here in relative amount. There's the peak here, so that's the peak, and then that's the peak sitting on the map. And you can see that what a lot of people from these different zones remembered was that there was a very strong impact on agricultural production as a result um, of the ash. You can see here, 82% of people in zone three had felt that they were producing less agriculture. It's not all doom and gloom though, because we found that some of the people who live around the volcanoes have got really good ideas about how to cope uh, with some of the things that happen as a result of ash. And this is my attempt at an infographic. All of you NVIST people here who learn how to use inf infographics. This is uh, an onion. This is a potato. And this is the relative balance of potatoes to onions cropped in 1999. And then this is the relative balance of uh, onions and potatoes in 2014. And that's about as biological as I will get. But um, basically, what they know about the onion is that the onion has got fantastically ash-resistant leaves. The ash kind of bounces off in it, and it doesn't cause much damage, 
Whereas at pretty much many stages of the cycle of potatoes, a little bit of ash can cause damage. And so there's huge change in the agriculture. And one of the things we're hoping to do in the coming years, we're actually going to go to Peru, and uh, the farmers from Ecuador are going to talk to the Peruvian farmers about some of these um, adaptations uh, that they've had. Now, the clever amongst you, and I, I can see some uh, trainee volcanologists in the audience, will have noticed that zone three, the nice peachy colored zone, is actually further away than um, zone one. Now, science says the further you go away from a volcano, the less the ash fall will be and the smaller the grain sizes should be. Our modeling of ash tells us that that's what should happen. What we were hearing from the people around volcanoes telling us about their experiences was, actually, there's greater impacts the further away you get from a volcano. There was more problems down here, and we're not actually doing a very good job of forecasting where that ash is going. You'd think we'd be awesome at forecasting ash um, <coughs> with all these meteorologists around. But actually... Uh, we could see that there was uh, strong anomalies in ash fall distribution. And this is the island of St. Vincent, and pretty much the same thing. And this is where uh, some of our more recent historical work has come in uh, very handy. These are some ash samples uh, from the Natural History Museum that David Par Pyle got from the archive. And these are some splendid, um, uh, just about Edwardian gentlemen, I guess, from 1902, who went out and subsampled. People just don't do that now. Went out and subsampled the ash on a sheet as it fell in Barbados and then posted it into the Natural History Museum or whoever was interested. And people were writing these fantastic accounts of what was going on uh, with the ash. But they were all telling us that the ash isn't quite falling the way that we might expect. So these, uh, Barbados is about 170 odd kilometers uh, from St. Vincent and it got quite a few centimetres of ash following this large explosion here. And you can see some of these patterns of ash fall in the near region on St. Vincent um, were a little bit odd too. So based on these historical accounts and actually boats sailing about all over the Caribbean delivering things, making uh, copious notes, we could tell quite a lot about the timings and the relative amount of ash fall and actually have very high levels of information a little bit like the outputs of very high resolution meteorological models of ash fall. And so what we thought we'd do, obviously because we have access uh, to meteorologists here uh, in the School of Environmental Sciences, is we actually thought we'd do is rather than try some of the standard ash fall modeling, is actually interest them enough uh, to get them to do some high resolution numerical modeling. And I won't say too much about this, but this is just to show you the difference in resolution, the resolution of the topography that then becomes very important for the physics of how the ash is distributed. And you can see here, this is South America. This is St. Vincent sitting in the middle here. And then this is what starts to happen once you start doing these things at a much higher uh, comparative um, resolution. And so what you can see here is that we're able to try and do a much more detailed simulation. And -da, it works we've actually managed to produce a much better reproduction of the actual ash fall that you see in St. Vincent, and then importantly also picked up this uh, anomalous ash fall in Barbados. And of course, this is important in the current day uh, because Barbados is an absolutely super busy air hub uh, for cruises and all sorts of activity uh, now. And we think that probably the, um, the time that ash will linger in the air is much greater. So not only will it be helpful in terms of forecasting impacts for farmers, it's actually got some <laughs> uh, comparative use in terms of forecasting how long it will stay in the air. Uh, so that's something uh, that we've been doing recently. And then more recently, <coughs> as a result of some of the Global Challenges Fund, We've had the privilege of working with some historians looking at this hugely detailed record that there is uh, from the Caribbean. And this is just one little example here. Um, obviously, sugar output is not representative of the poorest people and what's going on, but it does tell us quite a lot about how land exposure is. And what we're able to do now is we're starting to really kind of understand the comparative impacts of different types of hazards in the Caribbean by do, using um, this site, sort of um, historical reconstruction. So this is something 
uh, we're quite excited about doing um, at the moment. So my last example with risk uh, starts with one of the very first things I did uh, with risk, which was as part of um, Kat Haynes's uh, PhD project, which was a, uh, an adventure in working um, with social scientists. Uh, but initially, uh, like many physical scientists, I was kind of interested in risk communication. And I just had to show you this, because again, it's another serendipitous uh, having great experts here in ENDS. This is actually a GIS that was constructed for us by Ian Lake, uh, because we wanted to test how well people understood the kinds of hazard maps that were produced at the time, uh, which is based on the standard topographic contour map compared to photographs and then this uh, more GIS-based view of the, of the hazards on Montserrat. And just two very simple maps here. We just set out and strolled about the streets of Montserrat uh, and asked people if they could show us where different places were. And it doesn't matter where these places are, they're representative of places important to the hazards. So the tops of hills and valleys and how tightly clustered the dots are tell us how good people were, relatively speaking, at understanding and showing us uh, where it was on the map. And this is what it looked like when we showed people a topographic map. And then this is what it looked like uh, when we used um, Ian's GIS or the aerial photographs. So it just showed there, and even people were talking to us about this, the communication of hazard is really important. They didn't understand why lines were being placed where they were because the topographic contours that mean an awful lot to those of us who are geologists or geographers were actually comparatively meaningless. But when we use this uh, type of map, um, <coughs> that changed. And I'm really pleased to say that MVO now, they do use uh, a lot of uh, perspective maps so that people can understand that a great deal. So communication of risk is um, really important. And that's probably one of the most uh, fun projects that we've done around risk communication in Striva is another example of this, which is a series of films. And you can go and look at these films um, online in our Striva YouTube channel afterwards. I'm afraid I don't have time to show you any of them. But again, this was about the power of people wanting to tell their own stories about eruptions and the huge amount of information that's actually in there about how to prevent uh, how to be resilient to what happens the next time. And these are a series of stories about Soufriere uh, St. Vincent. And this is our very uh, long-term collaborator and good friend, Richie Robertson, from the Seismic Research Center, because what they said to us is we want to understand and hear about these hazards in a local way from the people uh, nearby. And then we have another film that commemorates <coughs> a disastrous eruption in um, 1985, uh, which was from uh, Nevada del Ruz. And this is because we showed that the St. Vincent films in Colombia, and the Colombians said we would really like to have these films that immortalize uh, that eruption ourselves. And we're currently working on a project with uh, Lambda Films, uh, the local company who we've been working with on these films uh, for the World Bank, which is kind of providing a sea change in how we present uh, films of volcanic eruptions, not as uh, disasters, but as things where people have huge amounts of their own uh, memory um, about the volcano. And this is some of Anna Hicks's research, where basically what we did is we sh went back and showed these films um, in, <coughs> in um, Colombia, and um, each of the films had a different purpose. One of them was really uh, to kind of help people understand what they need to do in the face uh, of an eruption and how to deal with the volcano and the other one was kind of commemorating and you can see here actually what we're really interested in was actually uh, people using that knowledge to actually take self-protective measures in the, few, in the case of another eruption and that's something uh, that we're very proud of indeed. So big piece of a risk jigsaw um, for this one. The only person whose name is missing uh, is deliberate. It's the meteorologist who was involved in, uh, most recently in the uh, modeling uh, of the ash around the volcano along with Alex Politis, which is my husband, who's been an incredible support. So I left his name out just so I could uh, mention him in particular uh, for all the kind of help and support and tolerance he has for my uh, volcano um, obsession. So just <coughs> to finish up, I wanted to say something. 
about the last part, which is about uh, reaching out. And I wanted to just say a word here about my upbringing and my mum and dad. So my dad uh, was a doctor and my mum worked for various charities and worked for Citizens Advice. And all through my childhood, uh, one of the things that was absolutely impressed on me was that uh, we live a pretty good life and we do good things. But the thing that my dad always really believed in was that if you give people chances in life and you enable them to understand and wonder, they will come with you and they will do that too. And so a lot of uh, the philosophy I have behind kind of a lot of the outreach that we've done, both as part of what we're doing with our project, but also thinking things through has come from that upbringing. And the more creative you are, the better. That science doesn't actually need to be a dry enterprise, that actually it should be something that's accessible to everybody and something uh, that could bring a lot of pleasure to people, but also that it has a really strong purpose. And if you have the privilege of being something like me, who's a university lecturer, you should use that uh, to do as much good as you can. Uh, and I'm very proud of some of the things that I've done with a lot of like-minded people over the last few years. Whether it's been actually working in primary schools around Balkan Tungarawa in Ecuador, uh, producing art uh, to uh, talk about their um, experience of living around a volcano, or the huge amount of stuff I've done uh, with UEA events um, over the year. And I should say, this is my mum here, uh, this is my daughter Ailey, and this is Morvan. And I'm very pleased to say that they've, not, they've inherited the creative side of their grandpa uh, as much as the um, scientific side. But they've been uh, a great uh, boost with that as well. But we've shown this uh, to many thousands of people uh, from all sorts of different walks of life. And it's a never-ending um, source of uh, pleasure. Um, do you know what? I didn't bring any to flog. What? <laughs> Sadly, I'm no capitalist. So, um, uh, Volcanoes Talk Trumps is something I'm extremely proud of because it's something that came out of a conversation and the kind of collaborative friendships that you grow uh, through working in a team uh, when you're doing things in the field. And there was a lot of people who spent a lot of time uh, arguing about the categories, uh, for sure, uh, but also throwing time at this. And it's something that the UK volcanological community has thrown itself behind as well. But UEA were incredibly supportive in terms of giving us some of the startup money uh, to get going with this. And we've created a fund which currently is paying for a book to be made in Ecuador which records children's memories of the eruption of Cotopaxi volcano that's reported to them uh, by their parents. And they're going to use that to sell them to create social enterprises for women who live and work on the slopes of Cotopaxi. So it's a, it's a great thing and it's been a source of um, endless pleasure and I should have brought some to sell to you all as well. Buy them online. Um, but that kind of uh, brings me to probably the most spectacular thing uh, that I've managed to do which is both um, Norfolk Volcano and then London Volcano. Uh, Norfolk Volcano was a bit of a uh, papier-mâché triumph of uh, Tamina Aslam and we had the tremendous experience of working with a proper pyrotechnic artist who did things at the Olympics, which was really very exciting to try and recreate a volcanic eruption on a hill. Thousands of people have seen this volcano erupt, both here in London, in Oxford, and then again um, at the uh, Norwich Cathedral. Uh, and it alighted a kind of creative spark in us, but actually with the research that we're doing just now, it's coming full circle and I'm really um, excited about this, which is why uh, I wanted to kind of finish off with this. This is a poem uh, by a fantastic uh, guy who um, lived on St. Vincent. He was a jazz musician and a poet. He wrote this poem 24 hours after the eruption of Sufair St. Vincent in 1979. And Wendy McMahon in uh, AMA has been uh, working with us on a project looking at cultural responses to eruptions. And we went uh, to St. Vincent in October and the uh, response uh, to what we were doing was just tremendous. People really want to talk about how this eruption happened. And it's really enriched our understanding of the volcano and what's happened during the course of the eruption. But what's really exciting is that one of the things we're going to be doing uh, in the new year is we're collaborating with Norwich Castle Museum and we're going to be making an exhibit 
which we are going to take out to St Vincent and they're going to have their own uh, permanent volcanic thing. And that's just uh, one of the examples of by reaching out, actually in the end it comes back to you and enriches your own research. Uh, but it's probably one of the uh, most interesting things I do. Thank you. Kevin Hiscock, Head of School in Volunteer Science. It's my great pleasure to um, thank Jenny for her inspiring, informative, enriching presentation. I think it's a great example of someone who's an interdisciplinary scientist, what we kind of strive to do here at UEA. So thank you very much for your great uh, presentation. We have a chance for a couple of minutes of uh, questions. If you've got any burning questions you want to ask Jenny when she's got her, her voice back. Yeah. All, all stunned. Stunned everyone's science. Oh, yes. Please. The correlation to rainfall and drought. <laughs> Why did that correlation not hold subsequently? Uh, so, well, um, I think it was to do with the configuration of the volcano. So for that particular phase of eruption, it was a docking great dome that sat on the top of the mountain. And I think there was time uh, for that particular variable to be the controlling variable, if you like. There's all sorts of different things that influence um, the growth of the dome, and at that particular moment, we just caught it when the rainfall was one of the controlling variables, I think, because it was big. <laughs> yes, sir. Can I ask you, um, when you take these um, local questionnaires and so on, how do you take into account the phenomenon of false memory syndrome? Oh. Absolutely. So I think this is one of the things that's so exciting about working with some of our colleagues in the humanities at the moment is because um, one of the things we're learning from them is it's not even that it's false, it's that memory is dynamic. And so uh, the story that you're wanting to gain from something will change according to how your life changes. So one of the things we do is we don't, uh, we very, very rarely do things where we just work with quantitative questionnaires Almost always, most of the stuff that we do, we work with um, uh, discussions and focus groups, and we do a lot of qualitative data analysis as well, because it enables us to kind of understand the context in which people are speaking. Uh, but right as you chat, I'm learning a huge amount uh, from uh, my colleagues in the humanities about exactly this kind of interpretation, uh, because it's an incredibly rich resource, uh, but it's something that we have to be quite careful about too. And scientists are capable of false memories too. <laughs> Gerald. Well, so if Maori legend is to be believed, they're married <laughs> to one another. Um, yes, the, you do actually have volcanoes that are closely connected. Uh, and one of the things that other people work on uh, is uh, connections between volcanic eruptions uh, relative one to the other. So very, very famously, so the Soufriere St. Vincent eruption I described, uh, it went off on the 7th of May, 1902. And then the very next day, Martinique Montpellier went off on the 8th of May, 1902. In fact, there was a ship that was anchored in the harbour uh, that thought, whoa, and then they were trying to get St. Vincent got stuck in the ash, and they thought, I know, we'll go to Martinique. And they were just pulling up in the harbour of Martinique when it, it, it went off. So there's actually quite a few um, instances of connected eruptions, and they think that some... Uh, as we start to understand magmatic systems more, there's more sense that some, some volcanoes are connected. N I'm not sure familiarly, though. <laughs> well, I should be looking at my onions with more respect. Uh, this year. You know, there are no volcanoes in Norfolk, but you never know. There, well, there was that one, wasn't it, in 2013? <laughs> anyway, we should um, stop for now. We can discuss with you and chat uh, out the back here. We have some refreshments and some thematically... Cakes, I think, yeah, have been there's baked. Seemed cakes have been baked. Yes, yeah, so do come and enjoy those. But before that, there's one final round of applause for Jenny's uh, presentation. <laughs>